You know, I don't think that we can talk about psychedelics without talking about all of the other overarching effects that it's going to bring about. I think that's one of the most magical and expansive things about psychedelics is not only are we going to have a mental health revolution and a spiritual revolution, we're also going to see changes in drug policy and drug policy reform and um, prison reform, reforming the punitive justice system and the way that we look at addiction and care for people that are addicted. And so not only is it an individual shift, it's a revolution. Hello and welcome back to Bath Time with Kylie Mack. Today I have one of my favorite, literal, literally favorite humans on oh. the entire planet. I'm so excited. We have Miss Claire Galactica <laughs> in the house, in the tub. And uh, Claire is such a multifaceted, dynamic Renaissance woman. And uh, there's so many topics that I feel like we could talk about today. So I'm kind of geeking out. I think we're going to try and narrow it down to like two or three. Uh, but I'm just so happy that you're here. We both live together. We share a wall. Uh, we've taken many a baths in here. And it's actually a vibe. Like in our house, we'll put like chairs in the bath. And like multiple women will just like sit around and we'll chat while someone's in the bath. And uh, it's just been such a great experience. Uh, but anyways, Claire, welcome. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> How fun is this? It's great. I don't even have to leave my house to help you out with this podcast. I know before we got on live, she was like, yeah, I mean, I wanted to take a bath tonight anyways. So <laughs> this is perfect. Don't do words. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we have so many things that I feel like we could talk about. Um, but one in particular is you just recently did your first Instagram live yeah. talking about one of the topics that you're most passionate about. And you mentioned to me the other day how you're like, you know, it's crazy how something that comes so naturally to you is like what other people actually really need. Mm -hmm. So you like don't even think it's a gift or you don't even like think it's your power because it's just like so a part of you. But then when you get the response of people being like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this or this inspired me. You're like, wait, I guess this is something I want to talk about. So do you want to share with everyone uh, what you're really passionate about and what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think it's really easy for us to overlook our gifts because our gifts mm -hmm. are usually the things that come very naturally to us. And I think especially in, I don't know, just Western society and like this day and age, we're kind of ingrained and conditioned to think that purpose is something outside of ourselves, or something that we go do or something that we contribute. And it's actually just who we are innately mm -hmm. um so the more you you can be the closer you are to living your purpose and that's going to change throughout your life i know there's been many chapters of claire and my purpose has been different in each one of them um but right now a major purpose for me is to educate people on psychedelics and all of the mental health benefits and societal benefits um that legalizing them and decriminalizing them and destigmatizing them will bring yeah, having more like a refined, intentional relationship with these things as medicine, a lot of them being plant-based anyways, like why is that considered illegal? And then mushrooms alone, like psilocybin, having its own intelligence, it's being its own kingdom, it's not part of the animal kingdom or plant kingdom, it's literally the fungi kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the more you kind of dive into it through Paul Stamets and all these people doing really like fast forward thinking and deep work, you know, it's healing the bee population, mushrooms, mushrooms are healing so many people's cancers and diseases. And so I think it's only natural that the more people know, the less, you can't unknow something, right? So it's like, the more you know, you're like, okay, well, I have a new truth now. Mm -hmm. So I think you've been a really good advocate in that space for like really bringing it, at least to our community, especially like the education, a lot of the politics around it and the policy and really being at the forefront of letting that movement actually, that like you've been a voice for the plants and the fungi kingdom in a big way, you know? Yeah. And like I said, that's a huge part of my purpose right now. And you know, I don't think that we can talk about psychedelics without talking about all of the other overarching effects that it's going to bring about. I think that's one of the most magical and expansive things about psychedelics is not only are we going to have a mental health revolution and a spiritual revolution, we're also going to see changes in drug policy and drug policy reform and um, 
prison reform, reforming the punitive justice system and the way that we look at addiction and care for people that are addicted. And so not only is it an individual shift, it's a revolution worldwide. Wow. Yeah. It's so inspiring. So do you want to talk about a little bit of like your own journey of how this even came about or how it found you or why this has become part of your purpose, why these amazing medicines and plants have kind of been choosing you to be their voice? And then maybe talking a little bit about um, those practices and safe ways to explore it. And I just, if you haven't checked out her Instagram live that she did, go to Claire Galactica. I'll link it in the description and watch it. And I'm sure she'll do much more, but she's kind of a go-to person for asking these questions too. We know you can do your own research, but Claire is definitely is someone who's like deep in the research, deep in the practice. Um, so I always want to advocate you as that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that the mushrooms teach us is that we are not islands and we're not doing this alone. I mean, the mushrooms themselves communicate over thousands of miles through the mycelial network. And so, I mean, yeah, it's really interesting that you said they've chosen me because it does feel that way <laughs> in a big respect. Um, and the more that I lean into them, the more they support me and the more people that they bring around who need support and who I can get support from. So we're forming our own little mycelial network just through talking about these things. Um, but what brought me to psychedelics was, I mean, <laughs> I think I was like any young person and very curious. Um, I'm definitely the type of person that always questions what I've been told and kind of like to go against the grain of normalcy, <laughs> um, which is probably why I'm such a huge advocate for this. But I actually, my background is in dance. I was a formally trained ballet dancer. And so I'm very embodied. I'm very about physical presence and physical health. Um, and that, of course, segued into yoga. I found yoga and meditation literally at the same time that I found psychedelics. And Oof. so for me, the two go really hand in hand. And it's interesting that a lot of new research that's coming out is um, essentially telling us that yoga, meditation and psychedelics have the same effect on your brain. They turn off the same part of your brain that we would associate with ego or how we relate ourselves to the world so that we can evolve and form new neural pathways and expand and up level. Um, so I love using the two together, both like for integration purposes and also um, just to gain insight into my life, into my larger life patterns that I can transform. Um, I think that I really became a huge advocate for it within the last few years after seeing some pretty close family members of mine sort of spiral due to pharmaceuticals and over prescribing pharmaceuticals. Um, and it's just become very apparent to me that Western medicine likes to put a Band-Aid on things and plant medicine and psychedelics and really Mother Earth spirit is here to show us the way of unlocking our potential and actually up leveling through the things that cause us pain and cause us trauma and cause us blocking um, without having to just put a bandaid on it or take a pill every day for the rest of your life. I think it's really, it's a way to get to the root cause of our problems. That's so powerful. And I love that you touched on that because I think so many people suffer with like if not light anxiety, like intense debilitating anxiety or depression or really, you know, manic breaks or night sweats or can't sleep or, you know, there's like so many things that stress can cause in our body and like past experiences can cause. And how I began to kind of find psilocybin in these different psychedelic realms was through trauma therapy work that I was doing. I was learning more about, wow, like it's been curing all these people's depression like one hero's dose of like a contained experience with either MDMA or with psilocybin is like launching these people off and they're mm -hmm. doing it once a year and they're off all their antidepressants and mm -hmm. medications and once a year and maybe they do it once a year, maybe they do it once every couple of years just as like kind of like refinement. But to me, I'm like, this is a no brainer. It grows in the freaking ground. It's been a long, as long as dinosaurs. And, you know, Paul Stamets, he talks about how I watched, um, I mean, I love him, I geek out on him. If you haven't watched 
fantastic fungi. I'll also link that below, but it's an epic movie to get started mm -hmm. and learn a little bit more about mushrooms as a whole, not just psilocybin and psychedelic mushrooms, but reishi and chaga and a lot of different chippy tail lions made all different kinds of mushrooms. Um, but what he talked about, I saw him at Envision last year or before pre-pandemic, uh, and he talked about how that's how Neanderthals, like our species evolved, is basically what they tracked in the human brain. And I'm sure you know, so they like geeked out on it, was that the Neanderthals would be tracking to hunt. So the animals would be pooping and out of the poop, that's how they would track is tracking the poop. But out of the poop would grow mushrooms. And for some reason, they're Neanderthals, they would just eat the mushrooms out of the poop and it creates all those neurological synapses and reactions in the brain and that's literally how our brain began to actually grow and evolve it was literally expanding our brain and our consciousness mm -hmm. on the spot each time it was taken and so he, they literally have he was showing like the skull size growing like the actual skull the bone growing and i'm like this is too out there but the more you do research the more you're like this is maybe why they don't want us having access or maybe people don't know about this. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to talk more a little bit, I kind of just went on a tangent, but talking more about either, um, you know, uh, the, what are the effects and the benefits of like, you know, people who are on the um, paramed or paramedics, the uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, like what the benefits have been in contrast mm -hmm. and like what they can actually do to help alleviate some of these like debilitating um, experiences a lot of us have in our modern era because we're just like these production drones totally you know doing our best out here but it's a lot of energy and we're not really taught how to deal with this stuff totally and I think too there's this pretty big discrepancy even within the spiritual community of not only spiritual bypassing mm -hmm. but I think also just a neglect of mental health and um, sort of using spiritual bypassing to bypass actual mental health problems um, everything's fine. Everything's, everything's fine. Yeah. Namaste. Or yeah. I just need to meditate more um, when maybe there's actually a deeper psychological problem that needs shifting or trauma that needs to be readdressed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just want to start by saying I definitely don't advocate for people coming off of their meds yeah. or using psychedelics in place of their meds. Um, if you're interested in using psychedelics for psychological help, definitely seek a counselor or a therapist, some kind of mental health professional that can guide you through that journey. Um, I know that people come to me a lot saying, I want to get off my meds. Can I start microdosing? And I usually tell them, come back to me in a month, like go off your meds and then come back to me when you're fully detoxed off of them. Mm -hmm. Because um, first of all, research is so fresh that we aren't sure what the long-term side effects would be of someone taking psychedelics when they're also on pharmaceuticals. Especially SSRIs. Especially SSRIs. And if you're taking an SSRI, then you're most likely going to miss out on a lot of the benefits um, because you're changing Locking. your brain chemistry in a synthetic way. Um, I think, though, you know... Starting it's, your journey with psychedelics is a lot about understanding that a lot of pain is going to come up for you. And that's why I sort of advocate for using practices like yoga, meditation, breath work, taking a bath, like really getting on your self-care game when you do start using psychedelics because a lot's going to come up for you. You're together, like in... Like to dance them together exactly. versus just doing that but still eating horrible or sleeping horrible exactly. but having a deep practice and maybe microdosing in that experience mm -hmm. maybe not doing a big hero's dose because that's exactly. also an option exactly yeah so yeah there are options you can do a microdose or a macro dose and whatever other integrative practices you can do along the way the better um because you are changing your brain like you just said um neanderthals most likely began to shift from ape to human through the ingestion of psychedelic substances. And this is kind of a study or a theory that is being thrown around a lot. Um, and yeah, it's really interesting. It's super interesting. Yeah. And especially if you, if you even take the psychedelic part out of the mushroom experience, when you learn more about the fungi kingdom, like, Thank you, Paul Stamets, once again, the mushroom man of the, of the millennium. Uh, he talks a lot about how, you know, he was studying the reishi mushroom on the bee population. And so the bee population has been suffering with the DMV virus. I believe it's called the damage, or 
damage wing virus, I believe DWV, something like that. Forget the exact disease name, but the, the bee population has been down as we all know. And he just started implementing reishi mushroom, which is like the, they call the queen of mushrooms into their water sources. And it started healing the virus. And it's like, of course, but of now course. we're healing the bee population, not through synthetics, not through weird shots, not through weird chemicals, but literally through a mushroom. A mushroom. Yeah. And then like chaga, which is like the king of mushrooms, is healing all kinds of things. It's great for anti-anxiety, immunity, all these amazing things. They have lion's mane and turkey tail. Like the more you go into even, not even the psychedelic realm of mushrooms and you play more in the fungi kingdom, it just seems like it's a benefit for all people. Like I have friends who had horrible, horrible anxiety or PTSD, real physical ailments like um, Lyme's disease was a big one. I have a lot of friends who have cured themselves, not even through microdosing or macrodosing, not even touching the psychedelic substances um, of the fungi kingdom, but really with reishi tinctures and chocolate tinctures and lion's wing tinctures and turkey tail tinctures and putting it in their tea every morning or in their coffee and um, you know, mushroom coffee is a whole thing now. And it just seems like mushrooms are really, I think our generation, we're going to see mushrooms really change the whole world, like Absolutely. in a really big way. And I know that's kind of, if you don't know anything about mushrooms at all, you're probably thinking, what is she talking about? <laughs> um, but I know there's a lot of people who, when you're in this field and you're studying, and I feel like I'm a medium person in this realm, but it's just so inspiring to be like, wow, this literally grows in nature. It's helping decompose. It's like, so it's in the mycelial network going through all the trees communicate through the mycelial network, which is like the mushroom network. And I'm totally on a tangent right now. But <laughs> just, it's so inspiring to think like we have answers and they're natural mm-hmm. and they've been here since the beginning of time. And we're just starting to kind of yeah. learn about it. I mean, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. I think what we're realizing is all mushroom, all mushrooms are magical. Um, not just the psychedelic ones, but mm. all mushrooms are magical. Um, but especially the psychedelic ones. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, and that's also what can get you out of that space. Like mm-hmm. you know, they talk about insanity kind of when you're like in a loop, you know, mm-hmm. or in a psychotic loop or a mm-hmm. manic loop. And the only way we break out of it is they talk about like creating that loop more into a spiral. Mm-hmm. And I think the only way you can sometimes pattern interrupt in a real way is if you get out of your own mind. And a lot of people, that's scary. They're like, no, 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 I'd rather just suffer and be in my own mm-hmm. state versus taking a substance that might stretch me out of that comfort zone. But if I take a small enough dose or if I'm contained by a counselor or teacher, someone yeah. who can hold the space, then I have a huge opportunity to reset my whole life. Yeah, and you I think know. there's still a lot of stigma and fear around psychedelics. I hear from people that are new to it that they've always wanted to try, but they're just so scared. Yeah, I hear um, that a lot. And I really don't think there's anything to be afraid of. I think we've really been fear conditioned into not doing this. I mean, I know that my drug education growing up was cops coming to the school and saying, don't do drugs, you'll go to jail. And you were anti most of your life, right? And most of my life, I mean, I grew up super Catholic, conservative, big family, like... I thought that weed was bad. Um, And I think that's another thing that they kind of do is they try to like blanket all drugs are bad. And I would, I don't know, I think a lot of my work is about challenging that narrative about like, okay, well, what's a drug? Mm -hmm. And I don't really like using the word drug to Mm -hmm. describe psychedelics because there's so much more than that. Yeah. And I think I'm also wondering how can we educate future generations around how to actually use these and what benefits there actually are. And I think, I mean, again, going back to what I mentioned before, it sort of all touches back upon destigmatizing mental health and addiction. Yeah. And teaching kids that, you know, if these are the signs of addiction, you know, and here's how to help somebody who is addicted. And here are substances that are not addictive. And here's some harm reduction practices because harm reduction is a new term to me, like within the last less than 10 years. I did not learn about harm reduction in school. I didn't learn about harm reduction in any ceremony. I, you know, it's kind of just a term that I heard floating around in the festival space around Zendo and yeah, yeah, different like maps and decrim meetings and yeah, I just, I think there's, there's so much education that can be done around this to negate some of the fear. Totally. And make it a more safe experience. And I think mm-hmm. that's something that 
pharmaceuticals do is they have prescriptions, right? So they're like, take two every eight hours, whatever, whatever, with food, with not with food, right? They have like consult your doctor. instructions, consult your doctor. Yeah. And what I what I think I would love to see, even in the marijuana industry and in the weed industry, is like people now, dispensaries are all across America. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the dispensaries, I mean, I'm not like a regular goer per se, but anytime I've been in one, I was like, oh, this is fun, you know? Um, I have other friends that go more, but to me, I just that hasn't been a part of my practice as part of my life as much. But um, if I was younger, that would have been amazing. <laughs> but I think what would be great is like having the dosages. Mm-hmm. You know, I think people are like, how much is five milligrams at, in an edible? Is that a lot, a little? How much should I take? And mm-hmm. people are kind of like having to learn for themselves, which you should always do. But there should, I think there could, could be, and hopefully will be some kind of like prescription basing of like, if you weigh this much and you're new to this substance or this plant, uh, this is like a, a starting, starting dose, dose. Mm-hmm. because I think then what happens is people are like, Ooh, I'm maybe in my fifties and I Coming used to smoke to weed when I was younger mm-hmm. and now I'm going to the dispensary and Whoa, weed isn't like when I was younger or, you know, because right. the dosages maybe are super different or maybe it is grown better or whatever it is. But to me, I think that like harm reduction and that safety around the prescribing of things totally. is super important. So I loved on your live, you were talking about like micro dosages and just like the right like measurements for things if you're starting, because that's when I think these things kind of get a bad rap. If someone eats an edible and then they're super sick and have the spins and are like nauseous for three days. Right. Okay, well like, yeah, who would want to do that? Totally. Or if someone eats seven grams of mushrooms and wants they to- two, totally. Or 0.5 or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So like, I think, and then that's when people are like, oh, I had a bad trip, never doing that again. Or, you yeah. know, so, I mean, one of my friends, um, bless his heart, when he was a, a kid, his mom had a bunch of mushroom chocolates in the fridge and he ate all of them. So he ended up having like 27 grams of mushrooms and was unconscious for three days. No. Um, but bless his heart, I mean, he was like 13 years old or something. And so for him in his now you know young adult life, he's like, oh no, I'm never eating mushrooms again. And right. in my head, he suffers with anxiety and social things and like is afraid to be around people. And for me, I'm like, oh, you know, a microdose could be really powerful for him. Not that I think mm-hmm. that's a blanket thing that everyone needs to do. No, but like you kind of know when someone could benefit. Yeah. And I'm also like, this kid's also done his time. Like totally. he's ascended the realms that no one probably has, you know, at so yeah. at a young age. So mm-hmm. I think things like that, where it's like super dangerous, mm-hmm. um, you know, where's that middle ground where we can start prescribing it? More totally. like pharmaceuticals, like more regulated in a sense of like, here are dosages. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the next, really? I would forecast, three to five years. We're probably going to be able to buy mushrooms in dispensaries. I know that you already can in many parts of the world and even in parts of California. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think right now one of the most crucial steps that all of us can take is just educating ourselves, forming communities where it's safe to talk about it. Um, seeking out mental health professionals that feel safe talking about it. I mean, I know that a lot of therapists are still kind of old school and don't know anything about it, maybe have their own fears and stigmas around it. Um, So making sure that you have a therapist or a mental health care provider that's open to discussing it with you. Um, Yeah, I think the revolution is happening. And of course, it's a gift and a curse. I think there's also a discussion to be had around the capitalization of psychedelics and now mm-hmm. there's you know stocks trading on the stock market for mm-hmm. psychedelic companies in Canada and Europe and stuff like that um which on the one hand it's like wow amazing like we can now get rich and gain wealth with these magical substances and at the same time are we honoring the indigenous people that they come from where is that wealth really going to how do we make sure that we honor these medicines and don't just commodify them and so i think we can look to the cannabis industry that is a few years ahead of the psychedelic sphere um and see sort of the holes that we didn't close or you know the hoops that we didn't jump through or the things that we did wrong yes. that we can now do right with psychedelics what about, do you know much, I mean, I haven't asked you this, so I don't expect you to know, but do you know much about like Amsterdam and their policies? I feel like they're kind of like the beacon of the world of like kind of yeah. pushing that boundary and like, it seems pretty safe and like relaxed and yeah. I've never been, but I just, that just popped in my head. Yeah. I can't really speak 
details about any of the legislature. Yeah, I just, yeah. I don't culturally, know it, yeah, yeah. but culturally, yes, they're on the cutting edge. I know that for many, many years, at least since I've been in high school, which yeah. is like 10, 15 years, holy crap. <laughs> um, since I've been in high school, people, I've heard stories of my friends going to Amsterdam and eating too many mushrooms and being like in the streets of Amsterdam and tripping um, because you can just go to the shop and buy truffles. Um, and that's definitely not a thing here, but there is a church in Oakland. There's a psilocybin church in Oakland. I want to say there is or will be soon something in Santa Cruz. Um, yeah, the Bay Area is pretty cutting edge, and so is the Pacific Northwest. I think Washington mm-hmm. is definitely, like, Dying mushroom man. land. Mm-hmm. Um, probably also Oregon. Oregon just decriminalized all drugs, which if... I don't know, I would suggest that everyone sort of read up on that because at first it sounds scary, like, oh no, crack is decriminalized, but it's like, yeah, but it should be because crack isn't a legal issue, it's a mental health issue. And cops shouldn't be arresting people for being addicted to something, they should be getting help. But that's a different story. Yeah, it's like two yeah. or three people on and that suffer from houselessness yeah. may experience some form, some form of schizophrenia. It's and a larger so systemic to, like, issue. Yeah, and that's sure. what it is linked to mental health. And I'm it's so a happy larger set systemic up. issue. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's interesting to think that mushrooms, LSD, MDMA, whatever, all these psychedelic medicines, once they are destigmatized, we'll probably be using them to care for people that are addicted to these other things. Totally. So getting people off SSRs, getting people off crack, getting people off like meth, all different kinds of psychosis alcohol. and meth, alcohol yeah. especially. Because a lot of people, I think, you know, one of my teachers said, um, was it actually I believe it was it was Russell Brand. When I was working with Russell, he <laughs> said um that one of his mentors when he was going through recovery um, you know, he was like, I'm just so ashamed, like alcohol, mm-hmm. heroin, like all these things that I've been like abusing. And his mentor was like, good for you, mate. And he was like, what? He's like, good for you. You found medicine. You didn't kill yourself. Right. He's like, it wasn't beautiful. <laughs> you, you effed up a lot of stuff along the way. Uh, but you made it like you were getting the medicine that you had access to. So to me, my mind goes, oh my gosh, you're right. What a, what a flip of the script totally. to instead of like, de- instead of criminalizing or dehumanizing people Shaming for them. using intense mm-hmm. substances, maybe that's all they had access to in their community. Or maybe that was their education. That's where it stopped. Right. You totally. know, so and like if we having had the drug education around psychedelics, as maybe medicine. more people would be taking mushrooms and LSD instead of crack because they would see it as a way to fix their problems instead of just running from them. And to connect with the mycelial network that literally is in the center of the earth and connects all trees and living right. things in the earth already yeah. seems like a potent place to tap into to remember why you're here and what yeah. your purpose is. And right, because when you use something yeah. like <laughs> mushrooms or iboga or ayahuasca or even something synthetic like LSD, I mean, because LSD is a molecule that was formed after a naturally occurring molecule, yeah. so it is very similar in its chemical makeup to nature. Um what I'm getting at is you're working with a molecule that has spirit and has consciousness. So you can form a relationship with it. Talk to rather, it. Rather, yes, of it course. It doesn't like take over. You can be like, whoa, I don't want to go down this way. Exactly. Rather than using something to get away from your problems or take you away from yourself. There are also, um, right now, there's some studies being done, research around creating a form of psilocybin, which is the active compound in magic mushrooms, uh, that's synthetic so that we know exactly what the dosage is because between batches of mushrooms, it can be different because it's a living, growing thing. Even if it's the same strain, even if it's from the same grower, totally. it can be a totally different experience. And so we're working on getting a synthetic form of psilocybin that's easier to dose more accurately. And they're also looking into creating a form of psilocybin that doesn't have psychedelic effects, which is interesting because I think a lot of people are afraid of Hmm. the psychoactive effects. Totally. However, I would advocate that having a spiritual experience will change you. End of story. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what a synthetic version would. Exactly. And maybe it's a natural mood booster. Maybe it creates new neural pathways in your brain. But to me, having that ego death 
on a large scale, on a small scale, whatever, having that spiritual experience, feeling yeah. connected to the world around you, Oof. there's nothing that beats that. Totally. And whatever you're going through, hard mental health challenges, addiction, trauma, anything else, having that spiritual experience and re-remembering where you come from and that you are part of something larger and that you are connected to everything heals so much. Oh, yeah. That's that's our ticket home is, is belonging and mm-hmm. feeling our purpose again, like a reason to live. Totally. And, you know, what I always talk about with my clients and students is, like, how do we continue to, like, come back to life fully? Mm-hmm. Even if you're alive, if you're working, if you're working out, if you're doing things, there's some parts of you that just, like, literally feel dead inside or mm-hmm. feel like you've turned them off or feel like you had to turn them off. So it's, like, how does every little part of us, like, fully come back to life and come back to light, mm-hmm. right? So that, like, you just picture the whole globe, all these little, like, gray energies just, like, boop, 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 popping on their light bulbs like little fireflies, you know, and just fully coming back to life. And that's one of my biggest prayers. And I think, you know, there's so many natural ways to do it. And um, yeah, and and do your best out there. Like in no way, I think, are either of us saying, you know, don't be on SSRIs, don't be on antidepressants, like do exactly what you need to do. Like there, there has been times when pharmaceuticals like saved me with so many situations. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's just a matter of like having the relationship, like, cool, I want to use this just for a moment to like help me get over the bridge. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be on this forever. Mm -hmm. And like, even some of my friends who are like on diabetes medications or all these other medications, like through diet, through all these things, like if you're focused and like gung ho, you can really heal yourself. You can come back to life and heal yourself fully from so many insane things the resources are out there. the resources are out there but it's sometimes easier to take a pill or take a shot and no harm done we're allowed to do it. that's what you want to do great but if you want to heal the root cause and like get to the systemic issue of what it is then i think the resources are out there and if you need support or you want uh people to talk to about it like i know claire and i are here for you and like we would love to do workshops events lives just answering questions and creating a safe container because I mean, growing up, I don't know if I really had safe containers for any of this, Mm -hmm. even to just talk about trauma, to talk about anything that you were going through. Like it kind of was just hush, hush, deal with it, drink a beer, smoke a blunt, whatever you were doing as a kid to try and get through this or work harder in school or Mm -hmm. play the sport or, you know, and Mm -hmm. kind of like bypass what's really going on. So not that we have to sit all day and trauma bond. That's not what we're doing. It's sitting all day to create a safe container for that part of you to be hurt so that you can actually let it go so that you can feel lighter and brighter and move on from that space and really remember who you are and come back to that with like an anchored, confident, secure sense of self. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're not perfect. We cry all the time. We're like always in our process, but we move through it faster every time. Yeah. And I think psychedelics to just my practice with psychedelics and my experience of doing medicine ceremonies have cracked me open to that place where I can cry every day and I can move through things and I know how to navigate that realm. Yes. Which is kind of tying into what I was saying earlier of like yoga and psychedelics have a lot in common where it's like, stay on the path. And when it gets hard, keep breathing, stay still, keep breathing. You can cry if you need to, you can take child's pose if you need to, metaphorically speaking. And Yeah, I think there's a lot to be learned from these substances and we're just at the tip of the iceberg. It's really beautiful. It's so exciting. Yeah, and thank you for being a beacon in our community, truly, for like the decrim stuff, everything with policy, everything with like even just education, with like use, because I think, you know, there's one end of the spectrum of people who are like afraid of these substances and these medicines. And then there's one end of the realm that have like maybe abused these realms and like, are like, oh, let's just go take shrooms and party, which is a great experience too, if you want. But also like, I love that Paul Stamets talks about like, no, they want to be called mushrooms or like mycelium versus mm-hmm. like shrimps, like mm-hmm. really honoring, you know, what they are and the, the medicines language. they have and the languaging is, is really big. And yeah. I just love that. I just love living, you know, as mindfully or intentionally as I can, not that I'm trying to be like a perfect human. And I want to be raw and real always. Yeah. And it's also cool to learn from the people who are at the forefront who've been doing this for so long, who have been like changing the world with these like wisdoms and sciences and research. And then from that space, really honor what's happening and like just continue to expand our mind even within the realms of learning about it. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yay. Well, thank you so much for hanging out in the bathtub. What did you think? Anytime. <laughs> you have fun? <laughs> Every time, yeah. I mean, shoot, the bath is my happy place, so. Right? Yeah.
Yeah, thanks. Have you ever, I guess we can end it by just asking, have you ever had a moment in the bathtub or like in a body of water where you had like either like an out-of-body experience or you felt like you were like hallucinating or like something magical happened? And if so, do you want to just bullet point some of those experiences? Yeah, I mean, recently actually I had this tremendous breakthrough in the bath. I was practicing box breathing, which is four counts in, four counts hold, four counts out, hold. Um, And that place after the exhale where you hold and you're just feeling yourself completely empty and the water is holding you and I just, I was consciously trying to completely relax and I kind of ingrained that place in me. And so now I can go back to that place of like, just like empty relaxation, floating vibes. (laughs) And so anytime I'm like driving or like getting caught up in my mind or whatever it is, whatever the day is throwing at me, I know that that place in me exists and I can always go back there. And that happened in the bath. And it happened in the bath. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> bath time. I'm telling you. There's like some codes in these little tubs. It's like going back to the womb. And something I was talking about. And actually, it's funny that like right when we sat it down, I looked at Claire and I just like saw her inner child. I was like, oh my God, I feel like we're five with our like scrunchies and like, you know. And it's funny because when I shot earlier, I talked about how I love the bath, even if just to like honor the inner child, like we all pretty much took baths. Right. So there's almost like maybe even an old memory in us. It's like, oh, this is like what I do or there's something there for us. Very normal. Right. And so I was like, oh, it was cute that when I sat down, you like had your like side pony with your scrunchie. I'm like, don't you feel like you're in a kid? And you're like, yeah, fully. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so fun. And I encourage you to take the house with your friends. Um, (laughs) uh, But thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope that this episode of Bath Time with Kylie Mack is just helping you feel a little bit lighter, a little bit brighter, so that you can continue to just come back to that place and you remember that you were already so full of love and magic and that you continue to overflow from that place truly out into the world around you. So I hope this finds you well. So much love. Ciao! <laughs>